Okay, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to cover cellular respiration, and this is basically how cells release stored energy. Now, this can be energy that they got from their own photosynthetic processes, or it can be energy that they obtain through nutrition, in other words, eating something because they're a heterotroph. Cellular respiration can also be considered the ways in which cells release stored energy. The energy is primarily chemical in nature and is often in the form of glucose, and then it gets converted into the universal energy source or currency called ATP. ATP is the prime energy carrier for all cells, both autotrophic and heterotrophic. There are several primary um, energy releasing pathways, but we're going to focus on two. The fermentation pathways and anaerobic electron transfer can release small quantities of energy without the use of oxygen and were the first types of energy releasing metabolism processes on the planet. Aerobic respiration which uses oxygen is the main energy releasing pathway leading to ATP formation in eukaryotes and it occurs in the mitochondria of those cells. Every cell begins its energy releasing pathways with the process of glycolysis. Remember lysis means to break apart. Glyco refers to glucose so it's breaking the part of glucose. This occurs in the cytoplasm regardless of what pathway we're on and it can produce two molecules of pyruvate and two net molecules of ATP. Aerobic respiration yields 36 total ATPs typically. There's a few ways to tweak it a little bit and get a little bit more but typically you say 36 is produced from aerobic pathways but fermentation or anaerobic pathways only produce two net ATPs. This is the summary equation for aerobic respiration, which is glucose plus oxygen gives you carbon dioxide and water. And if you notice, it is exactly the same as photosynthesis, only backwards, which means that those two processes are linked. Aerobic respiration happens in three basic simple steps, and I'm going to break them down to as simple as I can for you. It's a lot more complicated than this, obviously, but in introductory biology, you need no more than this. So the first step is glycolysis. It happens in the cytoplasm and it's the breakdown of glucose into two pyruvate molecules and a small amount of ATP is generated, two of them. Once we go into the mitochondria, we go into the Krebs cycle. Remember I said we had Calvin Benson cycle for photosynthesis? This is the Krebs cycle. Don't get those two confused. The Krebs cycle takes those pyruvates and it changes it into carbon dioxide and water. ATP gets produced, you get two out of that. Um, NAD and FAD accept hydrogen ions and electrons to be carried to the electron transfer chain. Now remember, NAD and FAD are the exact same thing as NADP+. They're trucks. All they do is they pick up ions and they move them from one place to the other and that's it. You don't have to keep track of them because this is not biochemistry. This is just basic biology, so it's a truck. So it, it makes carbon dioxide, it makes water, um, and it makes trucks and a little bit of ATP. And then the trucks move over to the third step, which happens on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So the Krebs cycle happens in the center of the mitochondria, in the matrix, um, it, which is similar to the stroma in the chlor chloroplast that we talked about last time. The electron transport chain and chemiosmotic phosphorylation is actually what it's called, but, but the electron transport chain happens on the membrane, and that's why you have such a big folded membrane in the mitochondria, why it looks like that wavy line, because it gives you more surface area to make more ATP, and the more surface area, the more ATP you get out of the electron transfer, and this is where the huge amount of energy is produced. It produces 32 net ATP and it also uses oxygen as the final electron acceptor. So oxygen really doesn't even come to play till the very end. So if you run out of oxygen, this is, this is what happens is it breaks down in the chemiosmotic phosphorylation process. Okay, just to remind you, this is the basic structure of glucose. This is the way that it all happens. And then we go into glycolysis. We're breaking it up. So glycolysis is like most machines. You have to put energy in to get energy out. So enzymes in the cytoplasm will catalyze several steps in the breakdown of this six carbon sugar glucose into two molecules of pyruvate, which are three carbon sugars. Oddly enough, six divided by two is still three. 
The end products of glycolysis for each gl glucose molecule are two pyruvates, two ATPs, and two trucks, NADH. So the energy requiring steps, two go in. The energy releasing steps, four go out. So your net yield is two ATP. In aerobic respiration, the Krebs cycle has two basic steps. Two molecules of ATP are produced by um, substrate level phosphorylation. In other words, you're making ATP. And carbon dioxide is released as a byproduct because you're actually breaking down those pyruvates into single carbon molecules, which is carbon dioxide. And then we move over into the big energy payoff, which is electron transfer phosphorylation, or ETP or ETC, electron transport chains. The trucks, NADH and FADH2, go into this system and they give up their electrons and transfer to the enzyme systems that are embedded in the membrane. So these are just those membrane-bound proteins just like we looked at before. When hydrogen ions flow in and out of this membrane through ATP synthases in the channels, the coupling of the inorganic phosphate to ADP gives you a whole bunch of ATP and that's how it, tra it traps the energy from those molecules moving back and forth into energy for ATP. Oxygen will then join with the spent electrons from the glucose molecule and the hydrogen ions to yield water. Without oxygen, electrons back up the electron transfer chains and no hydrogen gradients form. So in other words, you get a huge acid buildup. No gradient means no ATP and complex cells can't survive long without enough ATP for their processes. Oddly enough, um, for the more morbid of you, this is how cyanide kills you, is it prevents oxygen from linking up with those hydrogens. And basically, um, the acid buildup inside your cells happens so rapidly that it kills you pretty quickly, and you turn blue. Okay, so to sum up the energy harvest of this system, electron transfer yields 32 ATPs, glycolysis yields 2 ATPs net, and Krebs cycle yields two ATPs, and that gives you a grand total of 36 ATPs produced per glucose molecule in aerobic respiration versus the anaerobic respiration, which gives you only two ATPs. So anaerobic pathways operate when oxygen is absent or limited, and pyruvate from the glycolysis is metabolized to produce molecules other than some of the intermediates that go into the Krebs cycle. Organisms that carry on fermentation are diverse, and many die when they are exposed to ox oxygen, but some others use oxygen but switch when it becomes scarce, which means they are called facultative anaerobes, which means that they can do it anaerobically if they have to. Our muscle cells are facultatively anaerobic for short periods of time. They can go without oxygen for a short period and switch over to fermentation pathways. Fermentation yields enough energy for many single-celled organisms um, to survive and is sufficient for some aerobic cells when oxygen levels drop, but it is insufficient for large multi-celled organisms for a period of time. Alcoholic fermentation begins with glucose that gets degraded to a pyruvate molecule. Yeasts are valuable in the baking industry because the carbon dioxide byproduct makes the dough rise. It produces bubbles. And it's also produced in alcoholic beverage fermentation, but that can then be transferred into things like making soy sauce. Lactate fermentation happens in certain bacteria, um, such as the ones in milk, and muscle cells that have enzymes capable of converting these pyruvate to lactate molecules. And the lactate's nice because you can then reconvert it back to glucose and go back into the aerobic pathways if they need to. Some bacteria do have a po possibility of squeezing out just a couple more ATPs and they use anaerobic electron transfer on their cell membrane itself. Instead of a mitochondrial membrane, they actually use the cell membrane. Um, some bacteria and some of the ancient bacteria called archaeans actually use that um, in nutrient cycling for elements such as nitrogen and sulfur instead of starting with glucose. This will produce byproducts like hydrogen sulfide gas or swamp gas. Other anaerobes use this energy releasing pathway li that live near hydrothermal vents. But just in review, the processes of photosynthesis and aerobic cellular respiration are linked because the products of one become the, the reactants of the other and vice versa. 
Photosynthesis in plants produces the organic compounds and oxygen needed to sustain heterotrophic animals, and organisms release the carbon dioxide and water that's needed for photosynthesis. Life continues by a capacity for self-regulation and is sustained by energy from the sun. Okay, that concludes the, the cellular respiration chapter. Make sure that you review both the photosynthesis and cell respiration chapter so that you make sure you understand these processes very well and make sure that you remember the equations for it. Have a great day.